All right, good evening, everyone, and this is another edition of the STEM Files, where we'll be highlighting a young uh, student in bio, bio, not biology, I'm sorry, <laughs> a young student in molecular biology uh, who attends Georgia State University will learn more about her journey in studying the science behind albinism in cave fish. So check us out after this. All right, good evening, everyone, and once again, welcome to the STEM Files, where we are the voice of science, we are the voice of STEM talent and Black culture. I am one of your hosts, Tariq Mohammed, aka Tariq Cardiac. I'm a biomedical research scientist with a concentration in cardiovascular pathobiology, which is the study of how diseases form in the heart and blood vessels. I'm typically joined by my co-host, Jabril Engineer, aka Jabril, Jabril Mohammed, aka Jabril Engineer. He is a mechanical and materials engineer with the United States Navy studying naval ship fluid systems with a concentration in how, and I'm, I know I'm misquoting <laughs> what he does, but a concentration in how uh, different materials are developed to, uh, let, let's just say how different materials are developed. I know he's going to kill me for butchering what he does, mm -hmm. but um, typically joined by my right hand, your brain engineer, but tonight he had to handle a prior engagement and uh, we're going to just rock it out. With just myself and, and special guest tonight, uh, Sabria, Sab Sister Sabria Latayad. Am I pronouncing that right? Sabria Latayad. Latayad. Okay, excellent, excellent. Yeah. Welcome to, back to the show, back to the STEM files. How are you? Thank you. It's an honor to be back. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. By Allah's grace and mercy. Um, tonight's episode is is entitled "Black Women in Biology." Um, we are often um, gifted with the chance to see the power of our Black women in our culture. And it's a beautiful thing to see how uh, versatile and how educated our Black women are. So without further ado, I'm going to stop talking because I'm butchering everything because out of nervousness. I mean, you're so used to my brother being here with me. But um, let's go ahead and um, go ahead. Just go ahead and tell us more about yourself. Tell us more about your research and where you are in your journey right now. Yes, sir. Okay, so I'm Sabri Latayad, and I'm a junior biology undergrad at Georgia State University, and I am studying specifically molecular genetics in cell biology. So I'm looking to um, earn my master's degree through the dual degree program with the school, and um, I recently chose this pathway because genetics just really resonated with me. And after some um, experiences working at a clinic and doing some lab research, I really gravitated to this field. And I'm specifically looking at using model systems to analyze developed traits. So I'll be studying the genetic um, analysis of albinism in cave fish. Excellent, excellent. So let, let's backtrack a little bit. So on the STEM files, we're big on breaking down words so that everybody that is watching can understand what we're talking about so that nobody's lost in translation. So can you tell us, uh, first and foremost, what is a cave fish? <laughs> what is albinism? <laughs> and what is molecular genetics, molecular biology? Let's break down some of those terms. Absolutely. So a cave fish is one of two um, water forms of um, Astyanix mexicanus, or it's called the Mexican tetrafish. And it's found in um, caves like water caves of Mexico. And um, albinism was a evolved trait that scientists found in them, which is basically the lack of melanin pigmentation or expression in the hair, skin, and or eyes. And there are seven forms of albinism that is caused by the OCA gene or oculocutaneous um, albinism gene, which is um, oculo meaning the eyes, cutaneous meaning the skin, and um, we saw that present in cave fish. Mm. Now, can you give us a little uh, history of, of albinism, just how that evolved, how that evolved into a genetic disorder over time and where did it come from? Absolutely. So that's what I'm looking to discover more with my research now. But um, just in reference to 
some of the teachings like of the Nation of Islam and the Honorable Minister Luz Farrakhan, um, I referenced him from the series of messages he made in 2013 called The Time and What Must Be Done. And in part 39, he talked about the transgenic seed and um, mm. he discussed, um, it can be found on finalcall.com right now, um, the summary of the transcript. But uh, basically, he discussed the work of different scientists, Dr. Jonathan Pritchard, Dr. Chang, et cetera, Dr. Eberg, and that though their studies were aligned with um, the Honorable um, Elijah Muhammad's um, teachings about the origin of this OCA2 gene. Um, and so I wanted to connect the history of that with what we see in cave fish and the pathway that could have caused or why the reason why it developed and um yes excellent excellent now what so there's some people who are um who don't understand the difference between uh caucasian and albinism can you kind of go into the differences between the two yes so um anybody can express albinism it's an autosomal recessive condition um where um, there can be a carrier of two parents or two parents both have albinism and um, any any group of people can have albinism. So um, now I'm still doing some research. I'm just breaking into the differences between being Caucasian and albino, but I know there is a mutation on the OCA2 gene that is associated with that lack of melanin pigmentation in Caucasian people. Excellent, excellent. All right, so we have a um, a comment. I believe this is from this is from Rashid uh, L nineteen. <laughs> Peace. Speak <laughs> on that Oka two gene. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> and then we have our uh, sister Kalila uh, Marion Falcon listening in Delaware. All right. Peace, family. Thank you for tuning in. Um, so that Oka two gene that that is uh part of you know, genetic sequencing where we learn about the different types of genes that are found in a, a human genome or as a result of a mutation. So can you break down how this mutation forms and where, and where it stems from and how it fits in the grand yeah. scheme of things? Yes, sir. So this mutation forms, um, well, recently in the studies on cave fish, they're still trying to um, capture whether or not it was from random genetic drift or some sort of mutation. Um, but it's all in response to the environment. But the OCA2 gene is caused by, there's a mutation in the melanin synthesis pathway. And actually I do have um, a very thorough presentation um, explaining the pathway and um, the repression of this um, OCA2 synthesis. Excellent, excellent. So let's break down some more terms. <laughs> so yes, synthesis. What do you what do you what do you say when you say uh synth what do you mean when you say synthesis? So the OCA2 gene is going to be activated and basically it will cause certain proteins to um switch on and produce melanin pigmentation. Got it, got it. Are there any things that are the things that we do in our environment that cause certain genes to switch on? Or that Absolutely. can do that? Yes, sir. There are a number of factors. Um, diet, um, altitude even. Um, there's just many different factors that can contribute to that. Um, yes. So. Absolutely. So say, for example, right, uh, yes. my, most of my studies deal with the heart and the blood vessels, as I mentioned earlier on in the show. Um, so I, I've dealt with a lot of cases in studies where, you know, someone would have a genetic or a genetic predisposition to a uh, high cholesterol or high blood pressure and mm -hmm. due to their environment the way they live uh the way they the way they think it caused that genetic predisposition to uh, prevail at a much higher rate mm -hmm. than it normally would if somebody was just straight on how do you to live right. so those are can you give me an example in just you know, of anything that you've seen in your studies where an a certain environment did turn on a certain gene Yes. Um, so in cave fish, because it's a darker environment and there's more of an absence of primary productivity, which is basically um, certain organisms such as plants or photosynthetic 
um, bacteria or chemosynthetic bacteria, they're able to produce food for animals and organisms up the chain. Um, which would be consumers. And because there's an absence of that environment, plants are maybe not as able to efficiently make those sugars and those foods for the animals up the chain. Um, this causes a depletion of food in the environment of cavefish. So this depletion causes them to need, kind of have a need to develop enhanced feeding and foraging behaviors. And so in the melanin synthesis pathway, um, there's a diagram that shows um, there's it's a forking of the pathway. So either you can have melanin synthesis or you can branch off into a catecholamine synthesis pathway, which is responsible for producing certain hormones like epinephrine, norepinephrine, et cetera, for st controlling stress and feeding behaviors. And so basically what we saw in these studies is that the cave fish the mutation of the OCA2 gene allowed for the cavefish to prioritize um, better feeding and foraging behaviors opposed to melanin pigmentation. Excellent, excellent. All right, so before we get into your presentation, which you have up on the screen, uh, tell us a little bit more about how you got involved in uh, biology. What, what has been that, that journey like so far? Yes, so um, ever since I was little, I've always been into science and my parents and family and friends always cultivated that in me. And um, I started out by really going to a magnet school for fourth and fifth grade. And that really heightened my interest in all things science, all lab experiments. And so I continued on um, as that environment became a little distracting for me, um, my parents made the decision to pull me out of <laughs> elementary and essentially skip from after fifth grade, skip all of middle school to try <laughs> the online high school, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> powered through Kennesaw State University. And it sounds so daunting, but they believed in me and my siblings to be able to kind of transfer to high school. And, um, the first semester went really well, actually. Uh, I got some good grades and then we just decided we'll keep going. And, you know, I kept getting those A's, A's and B's. And, <laughs> and so <laughs> from there, we decided that um, I'd already been in online homeschooling for like four and a half years. So we're like, okay, it's time to, you know, elevate to the next level. And we discovered the dual enrollment program at Gwinnett Tech which helps you kind of transfer into college and um, get acclimated to that environment. And it really helped me to just grow from there. Um, so I, I started out doing some electives and prereqs at Gwinnett Tech, and I got my certificate in bioscience technology. So I was there for about two years, and then I we transferred to, I transferred to Georgia State University to major in biology and explore more programs there. And so over time, I took a biology career seminar course and that helped me to kind of navigate more and narrow down what it is I wanted to do. And after having some, also some experiences in intern at American Clinics for Preventive Med Medicine or advanced now, advanced clinics for preventive medicine, um, I saw a lot of that environment of some being in the lab, being the doctor, being the receptionist, you know, administrative assistant. And I was able to get an idea of what I did and did not necessarily want to do. And um, so I decided to pursue research. Um, initially, I had the idea of becoming a doctor, but um, I decided to pursue research just because I felt like it was more, it resonated more with my personality in that um, I feel that I'm very creative and I, like I love flexibility and being able to work on something new like all the time, be able to travel and discover new things and really affect change. Um, actually, recently I saw brother Dr. Jabril Muhammad's, um, the geneticist, I saw his work and essentially he's doing what I would love to do. Um, and <laughs> he said in there that in order to really affect change and have that kind of movement and ability to be flexible, you know, research is definitely the way to go. 
So I'm looking to pursue my master's in biology at Georgia State University and um, pursue the study of molecular genetics and cell biology. Excellent, excellent. So I would love to um, maybe facilitate a mentorship between you and uh, Dr. Jabril. That, wow. That'll be something that, yeah, that I, I'm sure he, he would love to, um, to speak to you, kind of guide you into, um, and there are, there are other tons of molecular geneticists in the nation alone uh, mm -hmm. that, 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 that we can you know, link you up with so that you can include myself. <laughs> I know yes. you, you kind of, you put me to the back burner for Dr. Jabril, but I got you, I got you, I got you. No, 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 I got you, I got you, I understand, I understand. But no, he, he's, he's a, a good brother to really understand exactly what molecular genetics is because he literally focuses on the genetics aspect of things. So I want to definitely make sure that, that you get in contact with him and that you can uh, learn some things from him and get to the point where you get to the same level in, in your career that he is. Thank you so you know. much. I'd be honored. Absolutely. Praise be to Allah. Okay. Um, so now we're going to, well, I have one more question before we go into your, your presentation. You, you're younger than the, the college, than the average college student in your position. So talk about how important it is for young people to rise to levels of, of greatness at early ages. Wow. Um, it's absolutely powerful. Um, young people, we are the future. And we have that neuroplasticity, guys. I'm just playing. But um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's it's really essential because you're when you cultivate a young mind from a young age, it just it's exponential, the potential and ability. And I, you know, my family poured so much support and love into me to pursue science and to really do something that, you know, I feel I can have an impact in contributing to, you know, the quality of life. Of other people, and um, I just feel that it's essential just to stay focused and really follow what resonates with you. And also, I would say to them, remember that you know STEM is in everything essentially. It's in yeah. music, it's in art, it's in um, culinary science. It, it's everywhere, you know. So um, I feel like to understand the fabric of how things work and really be in touch with reality. Um, and the truth and where the future is going, STEM is like, it's the way to go. Totally agree, totally agree. All right, so let's go ahead and acknowledge some comments we got here. We have uh, Liberty Gladden. She said, I, I rolled at uh, GT Gwinnett Technical College too in dual enrollment. Uh, we have a freedom fighter, uh, La Wapa, great job, sis. We have Believeness. Uh, amazing, Sabria. And then we have a question from your mom, uh, Sister That's Monique cool. Jenny. <laughs> um, what, if any, benefits have you found in research and genetics that can help those challenged with issues of albinism? Right. Okay. Hi, mom. So <laughs> I believe that it can help to spread more awareness and create more, um, you know, more maybe funding or um, support for finding those novel treatments that can address, you know, the condition of albinism, um, because a lot of people, um, a good amount of people suffer from this, and it doesn't seem to be getting the awareness that it needs, and it's it's a lot. Um, what they what people with albinism deal with, it's like on two fronts: the social and the scientific front, the biological consequences that come with that. And then the social consequences, um, the alienation perhaps from family and community settings. And so I feel that this research will definitely um, contribute to the innovation, the education and consideration for people with albinism. Um, there have been some studies, um, one where they tested in mice for oral nitizenone. <laughs> and um, they've seen that um, it's supposed to help treat Tyros tyrosinemia, um, yeah. which is basically like the type one version and to help restore melanin pigmentation. And there's been maybe not as much um, reversal or restoration as they expected, but you know, just being able to bring more awareness to this issue can help scientists to perhaps 
discover a topical treatment, um, anything that can help, you know, albinism, people with albinism um, have a better quality of life. Mm, excellent, excellent. All right, so for those who are watching, please keep the questions pouring in. Um, this has been a great and excellent uh, show so far. For those of you who are interested in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, Jabril and I are a part of a uh, two day, or well, yeah, two to two and a half day uh, summit called the STEM Success Summit. It's by it's the second annual event by STEM Media. It's pretty much a virtual conference designed to equip and empower you to launch and build a successful STEM career with purpose. So Jabril and I are gonna be participating in this um, event. So definitely, it's, you can still register for the event, it's free. So anybody who's interested in STEM, go ahead, it's, it's a platform for, for everybody, not just black people, but for everybody who's interested in STEM. Uh, we're gonna be presenting tomorrow on our uh, company, uh, Original Man Scientific, and the importance of research and development in your community. So definitely go ahead and check that out. Um, November 19th through the 21st, just go to stemsuccesssummit.com. Once again, it's stemsuccesssummit.com. All right, let's get to it. So what do we have in front of us right now? Okay, so here is my presentation, my eight minute breakdown of the genetic analysis of albinism in cave fish. And it just goes over everything from what is albinism? What, why is this important? to what we're looking at with the cave fish versus surface fish and why the melanin synthesis pathway is key to understanding albinism and the developed traits that evolve from this pathway. Awesome. Okay, so I'll begin. My research focuses on using model systems to analyze developed traits and I will be presenting my research on the genetic analysis of albinism in cave fish. Okay. Before you Why? continue, yes. before we continue, let's make sure that we we try to simplify as much as we can. We just got to be, you know, mindful of our audience. And if there's anything that, that sounds too complex to the average person, go ahead and break that down for us. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, why? Yes, sir. Well, organisms are very diverse, inhabiting various ecosystems and expressing a variety of traits influenced by the environment. Across the biome, we see organisms with intricate, very detailed plumages, like the peacock up at the top left, various camouflage techniques, and unique mating rituals. These traits can be altered and adapted over time in response to the environment, perhaps due to mechanisms such as mutation or genetic drift, which can aid in an organism's protection, their ability to feed, the reproductive advantages, and more. Some organisms, however, adapt a typically unfavorable trait in isolated situations. Albinism is a key example of such trait. Seen in humans, animals, and even plants, this autosomal recessive condition is characterized by having little or no production of pigmentation. And by autosomal recessive, that means inheriting it from the somatic cells um, or the bo regular body cells of the parents, not the sex or gametic cells. And um, recessive meaning that you'll need two alleles of that gene to be expressed. Um, and so while albinism in plants results from a lack of the pigment chlorophyll, albinism in humans and animals are expressed by the absence of the pigment melanin present in the skin, hair, and or eyes. Melanin pigmentation protects organisms from damage by UV light and plays important roles in vision, sexual display, mimicry, camouflage, and innate immunity, having immunity already naturally. The OCA gene is primarily responsible for the albinism phenotype of which there are seven known forms. Scientists are still trying to understand the reasons for, consequences of, and solutions to these specially evolved and expressed forms of albinism. The goal of my research is to expand our understanding of albinism as an evolutionary and developmental model trait using a model system of cavefish in the melanin synthesis pathway in cavefish so that further research regarding albinism and albinism related genes, biochemical pathways or organisms can be better, better articulated and translated. From identifying this basis, functional genetic research 
research can drive the innovation of effective novel treatments and technologies, as well as provide the appropriate education and consideration for this condition. And I'm predicting that there will be a linkage between any single mute, mutated gene in the melanin synthesis pathway and the number of direct and inverse pleiotropic relationships that result phenotypically. And the pleiotropic relationship would be where one gene in this pathway would cause a number of traits to physically manifest in the organism. So you have mel melanin pigmentation, a lack of that in the eyes, and it also be a lack of that in the skin, and maybe other consequences that are manifested from the mutation in the OCA2 gene. Mm, so a little it, background. Yes, sir. For this in-depth and efficient research, a Styanex mexicanus, a handful, or the Mexican tetra, is a suitable albino model organism having an ease of laboratory culture and the ability to perform genetic analysis and induce mutagenesis, which in simple terms is changing or altering a gene causing a mutation. And, and it can induce mutagenesis in melanin synthesis related pathways with the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing system. And if anyone's heard of the CRISPR-Cas9 system, it's basically a, tech, a, a recent technology that has caused a whole span of different studies and other technologies to develop where um, RNA would be, would hold the gene and allow it to be altered. And um, you'll use a guide RNA to target a specific sequence on the DNA genome um, to induce a mutation. A style yeah, so, Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. So basically with CRISPR, and I've used this a lot uh, in, in the lab and in, in a lot of my studies. So basically CRISPR is a tool that allows you to take a piece of, of RNA and use it to travel to a specific site in, uh, in the overall grand scheme of someone's DNA, correct? Yes, sir. Absolutely. And then alter that whatever piece is causing the mutation. Absolutely, yes, sir. Which right. can have con further consequences. It can cause further mutations, but that's a whole other story of ethics and. <laughs> right, right. Yes, sir. So, okay, Astyanex mexicanus is a species of fish that exists in two forms a sided river dwelling surface form and a mul multiple blinded depigmented cave dwelling forms that inhabit over 29 caves in central Mexico. These fish have a well-studied evolutionary history and it is known that both extant or currently living surface fish and cave fish evolved from a surface fish ancestor. Multiple extant cave fish species have evolved independently, however, and are exhibiting a number of novel, new morphological, behavioral, and physiological traits. Now, mm -hmm. the nitty gritty. The developed <laughs> albinism in cave fish is actually thought to be a potential evolutionary benefit instead of a negative consequence, which may be to provide excess L-tyrosine as a precursor for the elevated catecholamine synthesis pathway, synthesis pathway, which could be important for adaptation to the challenging cave environment. So from here, mm. you see this diverging, and we'll break this down here in a second. Um, after L-phenylalanine, this compound highlighted here is converted to L-tyrosine by the enzyme phen phenylalanine hydroxylase the defect caused by the OCA2 loss of function stimulates the catecholamine system. And here you can see circled in red is that mutant gene, which inhibits the rest of this pathway um, circled in black, this huge melanin synthesis pathway. And it causes the turning on or the onset of the catecholamine synthesis pathway as an alternative to this pathway that was inhibited. And catecholamine is, this pathway is known to be responsible and, or associated with stress response, as well as feeding and sleep behaviors in vertebrates. In light of the catecholamine in increase, cave fish have developed more efficient feeding and foraging behaviors, which may be in response to their food depleted cave habitat due to the absence of primary productivity in this environment. However, melanin pigmentation can be rescued by exogenous L-DOPA, 
or dopamine basically that was introduced from an external source and that wasn't created mm. by the body. Um, which this indicates that melanin synthesis is blocked at its first step um, in albino cavefish. Scientists further confirm the role of OCA2 in this pathway using CRISPR mutagenesis in surface fish, which we'll see here. So to confirm the role of OCA2 in a Styanix mexicanus using CRISPR-Cas9, founder um, surface fish were injected with a guide RNA targeting the OCA2 gene. Scientists were able to assess the resulting phenotypes of these OCA2 mutant fish by in-crossing them. So by crossing in, like inbreeding the generation. So it's the same generation and they cross them together to see what would happen. In this figure, images A through C represent the surface fish that have a typical melanin pigmentation pattern, producing pigment in the retinal pigment epithelium or the RPE of the eye and throughout the body. So we see the RPE here in G and H prime, um, while images D through F show the surface fish, which do not produce melanin in these areas during development or as adults. Scientists also cross section both pigmented in albino surface fish, which I referred to in G, G prime, H and H prime. Um, and a cross section is basically, it's it sounds pretty, but it's, actually quite violent to me, you slit the fish down the middle and open it up so that you can get a better visual of the body. And what scientists wanted to visualize here was the eye. This lining in the back of the eye um, surrounding that retinal is the RPE that's between the retina and the blood barrier of the body. Um, mm. And you think so you those that was and G and G prime. I, I feel like it is because I, I just I love being, you know, caring and careful with the animals. I got but you. um <laughs> I'm not sure how ethical this is, but I mean it research, but um so yeah. G and G prime. Um this shows that melanin pigmentation, same organism as A through C and H and H prime, you can see that lining in the back of the eye there's that dark line is not present which would be the melanin pigmentation mm. wow and, wow wow yes sir in conclusion this current research presents a novel example of pleiotropy in albinism which can allow us to uncover various phenotypic or physical consequences of mutating any single gene in this pathway for example PKU or phenylketonuria is a human illness that results in both intellectual disability and lighter hair and skin caused by a mutation in the enzyme we saw earlier, phenylalanine hydroxylase, that gene. And this is the enzyme that converts L-phenylalanine to L-tyrosine. While this direct relationship pleiotropy has serious health consequences, in the research that was conducted on cave fish, we actually see an inverse relationship pleiotropy where it has potential evolutionary benefits for adaptation to a challenging cave environment. By studying cave fish, cave, cave fish troglomorphism or the physical traits using gene editing technology such as CRISPR-Cas9 and linkage analysis tools such as QTL, excuse me, I'm looking to expand on the various consequences of altering genes in this diverging biochemical pathway in hopes that more knowledge can be uncovered regarding the evolutionary force generating OCA or oculocutaneous albinism as well as the benefits and the possible treatments thereof. And that mm. is the conclusion of my presentation. So. Excellent, excellent, wonderful job. Wonderful, Thank wonderful you. job. So, you know, that was a lot, <laughs> you know, <laughs> okay. and I, I am, I'm extremely impressed with um, what you've been able to do with your research. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. on our company website, Original Man Scientific, we're gonna be adding a special page where black scientists, young black scientists such as, such as yourself can post uh, your research and in the and one of the first black owned research journals. Wow. So that's gonna be great. excellent, excellent. So mm -hmm. that's gonna be one of the cool the one of the greatest things that, that come from 
um, this platform. It's for young people such as yourself, myself, Jabril, all the scientists that we can think of in the black and brown community to come in, or anyone for that matter, come in and post their research for people to, uh, to read about and, and study. Um, there are a few words Thank that you me. mentioned. Absolutely, yes ma'am. There are a few words that you mentioned in your presentation, mutation and phenotype. Can you break down some of those words? Yes, yeah. so mutation is basically um, any a factor that alters the gene sequence or um, it will alter the genotype um, or the, the genetic, um, um, how do I say this, the genetic um, consequence. So what will happen is if you mutate something, it will change the way that it is expressed and um, it can cause, it can have multiple consequences. They can be positive or they can be negative, but it's basically just an alteration of a gene by a number of factors, could be the environment, um, diet, et cetera. And a phenotype is basically the physical manifestation of the genotype. So the genotype will be um, in the genome coding for a specific trait, and the phenotype is that actual trait being manifested um, in the organism. Got it, got it. And why, why is it important for um, members of our community to understand how genetics, to understand genetics so that they can live better lives? It's important because um, genetics is like our DNA has memory and mm. sort of like our immunity, we see kind of almost an instant um, evolving of the immunity and, and resistance to certain pathogens, viruses, etc. DNA is something that maybe takes more time or is not seen or documented as closely but it is very much has memory and anything you anything that you do anything that you eat will over time influence um your genes and it will influence um the prevalence of certain disorders certain um illnesses or certain favorable traits that you can pass down to your offspring so it's really important for us to know um how to care for ourselves and how to positively evolve our genes. So it's safe to say that um, people shouldn't be intimidated or defeated by the thought of a, a genetic predisposition, predisposition that they've been diagnosed with, that it is possible to fight it off by the way you live your life. Absolutely, yes, sir. Um, when I was shadowing um, Dr. Richardson at the advanced clinics of preventive medicine, I remember in one, um, one time he was saying that genetics is responsible for 14% of your health and that other 86% would be due to diet and environment. So while genetics is very important, you can influence your genes and you can influence um, what you're passing on to your offspring or even your own life. You can positively influence your life if you're taking certain precautions um, and you know, eating but good food or being in a healthy environment that is most suitable for you. So, excellent, excellent. All right, so we have another set of questions for for mom. Uh, so she says, so by examining a genetic sample, you can identify any pollutants introduced or challenges in the environment that can cause an internal mutation in producing melanin that becomes visible. Correct. Um, yes, you, you can visualize that with, um, you can visualize that in the genes. So the genes are going to be telling us a story and essentially scientists are trying to figure out what it's saying. Mm, mm, that, that is one of the greatest, that is one of the best ways I've ever heard anyone explain genetics, wow. you know, so that the fact that you are a student in genetics and haven't yet finished your goal and what you're studying. And you're, and you're able to explain it so well, so fluently and articulate Thank exactly you. what it is, you know, that, that is a blessing. So I, I commend you on that. Yes. Sir. All right. So the other part of that question, so, and that, and she said, and that organism then adapts or unlocks other genetic coding to survive and or thrive, correct? Correct. So uh, a series of 
um, different consequences, like we saw with the melanin synthesis pathway, um, the body chose to prioritize, the genes prioritized the expression of catecholamine in opposed to melanin. So it was like an either or, and it prioritized the survival. So what was best, it was better to have better enhanced feeding and foraging behaviors than to have that melanin pigmentation. So. Mm. Got it, got it. Well, this has uh, been uh, a great edition of the STEM Files. Uh, I believe this is your third time being on the show, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And we, we've watched you uh, grow over the years into your studies. And, you know, not only do you look exactly the same, you know, <laughs> your, your energy is the same. So I definitely encourage you to keep that same energy when studying science because it can drain the mess out of you. <laughs> You know, it, it can definitely, it, it takes on a life of its own inside of your mind. You know, so the fact that you're able to keep your youth, keep that energy is great. So hold on to that. It, it changes everything, you know. Um, and, and the fact that you were able to quote the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan from the time of What Must Be Done, when he taught, he, he talked about a lot of scientific things in that series. You know, so the fact that you were able to use what he has taught us use what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has taught us to further advance your research, yes. you know, speaks volumes. And that's exactly what the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan wanted from the scientists and engineers was to use the teachings, to use the science that we've been taught to bring the teachings to the forefront, you know, so you've done mm -hmm. an, an incredible job with that. Excellent. All praises so due how, to Allah and- mm -hmm. Okay, sis, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes, sir. I'm just saying um, that's my foundation, these teachings, and I'm honored to be able to expand on my understanding of that and maybe help enlighten other people on how real and how true this really is and how important it is to implement that knowledge in our lives. Mm, beautiful, beautiful. So. Now, if someone wanted to learn more about what you're studying and learn more about uh, your research, how can they contact you? Um, you can contact me at my email, sabri019 at gmail.com. And I also have an Instagram um, if you'd like to reach out to me there. And a Facebook, um, Sabri Amane. You can find me there, or Sabri Latayad. And um, I'm still developing some more professional profiles, such as LinkedIn. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. We'll definitely share that um, in our networks as well. So people can get to get to know your work on a more uh, professional scale. So yes. at this time, we have a, we're coming towards the conclusion of the show. We have what's called the STEM, I don't know if you've been watching the show recently, but we have what's called the STEM file speed round. And it's pretty mm -hmm. much a portion of the show where we get to know you a little bit more uh, outside of science. So okay. you ready for it? Yes. <laughs> All right, awesome. What's the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning? Um, get ready, get washed up. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Okay, so uh, let's see, hot or cold? I'm sorry? Hot or cold? Hot. <laughs> <laughs> got you, got you. All right, um, if you were stuck on an island for one year, what are the three albums that you had to have with you? Three albums or? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Ooh, see, I know songs. I, I know a bunch of random songs. Okay. Three albums. I honestly, I can think maybe songs. I'm not sure. I would definitely okay. have the Adon so I can, you know, get ready for prayer. Um, right, right. Wow. Um, something from, I don't know, something French. I'm learning French and <laughs> something <laughs> uh from Janaiko? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> got you, got you. Okay, cool, cool. So what was what's what's the worst job you've ever had? Ooh, this is and tough. I know you, you're still you're still young, so I, I know you know it's a it's a possibility that that yeah that hasn't even happened yet. Right. So my experiences have been good. So I'd say the worst <laughs> was maybe working at an ice cream shop, which is not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad at all. Okay. All right. Cool. Cool. If you could meet anybody from the past, 
um, in science or just anyone that, that you look up to from the past, who would it be? Wow. Mm. And what, right what would the you ask Mm. It's two people in my head right now. I want to say Francis Cress Welsing and Maya Angelou. Um, mm. Why those two? I would ask um, Francis Cress Welsing. She she really inspired me as well in her detailed research, and she really talked about um, what it's the the plight and the history of different, you know, melanated peoples um, on earth over time. And the way she goes into it is so detailed and intricate. And um, it really inspired my my perspective and my research in genetics as well. Um, mm. I'd say Maya Angelou, I love um, her story. I love her, you know, her, her words, how she's able to express herself. She's very poetic. And she has an inordinate sense of life that was, you know, it allowed me to open my perspective as well. Um, I would have to think though, on what exactly I would ask them. I have to prepare something really good. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Do you, if you weren't a scientist or if you weren't studying science, what would you be doing right now? I would probably be singing or cooking. <laughs> <laughs> because Excellent. I do those all the time. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. Um, who's your greatest influence in your life? Wow. Oh, man. Wow. I'm going to start with the Honorable Mr. Luz Farrakhan. Um, Got to. Yes. And Excellent. his teachers. Yes. Excellent, excellent. Anyone in your personal life that inspires you? Yes, um, my parents, my siblings, <laughs> my whole family, <laughs> um, my friends as well, and new people I'm meeting and connecting with that we share similar interests or, you know, the, the brother Dr. Jabril's, you, brother Jabril, Jabrilian engineer, you know. Um, <laughs> Praise me to all. Yes, lot. absolutely. I'm very inspired by all of you, so. Well, we're definitely we're definitely inspired by you as well. You know, it's it's a uh, uh, it's a great feeling to see this. You know, our nation is secure, and we 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 have a an abundance of talent and, and skills in our nation that can really uh, make a difference, and that that uh, that is making a difference. So, very proud of you. Very proud of uh, how far you've come in your studies, and I. It, Anything I can do, Jabril, the Ministry of Science and Technology, OMS, that we can do to support you um, in your endeavors, please let us know. And matter of fact, you won't even have to ask us. We'll be we'll be on you like a hawk, <laughs> making sure that we, we oh, give yeah. you what you need. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, excellent, excellent. Yes. So one final question. My name is Sabria Lata. Lata oh God, I'm always doing this wrong. <laughs> How you pronounce it again? Sabria. Sabria Latayad. <laughs> Latayad. Okay. Latayad. Got it. My name is Sab Sabria Latayad, and I am. My name is Sabria Latayad, and I am a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, once again, uh, for those who are watching, thank you so much for tuning in to the STEM files where we highlight. Uh, STEM talent in black and brown culture. We are also the voice of the best and brightest in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in your community. So once again, I want to thank uh, Sister Sabria for joining us for the third time. She is a, what you call a triple crown in the STEM file. She's been on the blog talk edition. She's been on the old YouTube days and now the current version of the STEM file. So um, you'll definitely be getting a medal for that <laughs> uh, in the mail. <laughs> But um, but once again, thank you for joining us tonight. Is there anything that you want to leave the audience with? Um, I just want to thank you all for you know coming and supporting, and I just want you all to know that I'm I'm definitely a servant, and I you know will continue to strive to help you know our people. So thank you. Excellent, excellent.
All right, family, for those who are watching, if you'd like to support the content that you're seeing right now, don't hesitate to uh, drop some love in our cash app, the STEM files, or just look at the, just visit the link in the description. Once again, my name is Tariq Muhammad, aka Tariq Cardiac, typically joined by Jabril, Jabril Muhammad, aka Jabrilian Engineer. This has been another edition of the STEM Files. Tune in this coming Saturday for our next edition of the STEM Files, where we'll be interviewing Brother Frank X. Hudson. Um, I believe he's still in Texas, and he specializes in network security. So tune in uh, this coming Saturday, 6 p.m. Eastern Time on the STEM Files. Peace and blessings, everyone.